So I'm going to start being, as I say, provocative, because I'm a bit frustrated about the theoretical field. For 27 years, we've been laboring with lots of different models that are only accepted by the author. <laughs> there is no consensus whatsoever about what is the cause of confusion. Very few experiments actually test the theories. And that's not too surprising, because very few theories actually make clear predictions. So we must, if we're, if we're theoreticians, we must make predictions, and we expect, we ought to expect, uh, experimental, experimentalists to test them. And that's exactly what I would like to do. I'm going to tell you what some other theories, not mine, predict, and we'll see whether or not they match with the reality we already know. <coughs> right. <laughs> Uh, my, my last point here is there has been an obsession, and I really mean this in the uh, pathological way, with demonstration, demonstrating that Fleischmann and Pons were right in claiming uh, an anomalous <coughs> excess heat result. But that is not science, that is psychology, that's emotion, and we ought to be cold, cold-blooded scientists and actually get to the truth and not just supporting our friends. So, what kind of nuclear reactions are we familiar with in condensed matter? <coughs> condensed matter nuclear science is not something new. We've had fission reactors for uh, 70 odd years or something. Bill, uh, could it be you're out of sync with this slide you're sharing? No. I think you're. Oh, I am, so yes, so I beg right. your pardon. <coughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm looking at the screen here, and there are two. Um, I think yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I, 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 I beg your pardon. Thank you, thank you very much for that very good point. Okay, there are two fundamental things we notice at room temperature as far as nuclear reactions are concerned. One is rather trivial nuclear decay, but you, uh, radium, for example, is able to boil its own weight of water every hour, I think, which is, in theory, uh, excess heat. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the <coughs> nuclear fission of actinides, uh, uranium, uh, plutonium, etc. But unfortunately, they produce very intense beta-radioactive uh, daughter products. <coughs> so that, none of those really look like a solution to the cold fusion. However, they give you an idea about what is uh, important. <coughs> so let's think for a moment about the basics of nuclear physics. What kind of reactions are going to be fast? What kind of reactions do not produce any radiation? Because we're all alive today. Well, some of us. And um, we, uh, Fleischmann and Pons and many others ought to have been killed by the gamma radiation of, say, deuterium-deuterium fusion. And the third point is, it seems terribly obvious, what kind of reactions produce heat? And people will say, oh, all nuclear reactions, if they're exothermic, produce heat. That's not true. It may be that a, a very light particle like a neutrino could take off all the energy and you get no heat at all. So, for example, people who say, uh, people do say, uh, the, the PEP reaction, the one, the one in the sun, which, uh, in which two protons are fused to form deuterium and with an electron, ought to produce heat. It does not. So there are subtle differences about an exothermic reaction and a heat-producing reaction. Now, I'm going to suggest that the, the, the criteria for fast reactions are going to be uh, no Coulomb barriers, or no energy barriers, I should say, more generally speaking. That means that the, the, um, the products, or the reactant and the reactants, should not both be charged We'll see that in a moment. Secondly, no electromagnetic transitions. What does that mean? That means that we don't emit gamma, prompt gammas uh, when the reaction occurs. That is because a strong reaction is seven orders of magnitude faster. So why should we consider uh, uh, an electromagnetic uh, tra uh, transition which is inherently less probable? This is quite, um, quite a good thing to do because we know we don't get radiation, so therefore that is a very good pointer that we're dealing with strong interactions only. 
and of course, uh, no weak, re weak reactions, weak interactions. The electromagnetic re um, uh, interactions are about seven orders of magnitude slower than the nuclear re strong reactions, but the weak re interactions are 28 orders of magnitude. We really shouldn't be uh, looking at these uh, reactions, which are inherently extremely unlikely. And yet, um, there are many theories, like the William Larson theory, uh, Storms' theory, which invoke um, uh, electron captures. Some, in the case of storms, also with uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, interactions as well, multi-body reactions, these are very, very unlikely solutions. And of course, we have to uh, obey all the laws of physics, thermodynamics particularly. Now, I made a little list here of um, what I consider to be some very fast reactions which are generally accepted in physics. Um, one is the, uh, the neutron capture by uh, EM3 producing tritium, and that has a, a cross-section of 55,000 barns. And a typical neutron capture would have been about one barn. Why do we have this enormous enhancement? And the answer is, all neutron captures, almost by definition, produce a gamma ray. So they are seven orders of magnitude slower. And lo and behold, we see this reaction is, uh, well, it's not seven orders of magnitude, it's about uh, five orders of magnitude faster. So we're in the, we're in the right ballpark, more or less. And uh, uh, the neutron and the lithium-6 is very similar. Neutron and boron-10, again, very similar. The exception here is uh, xenon-135, which is a, a radioactive um, fission product in uh, uh, reactors, which has two million as a, <laughs> this looks like an exception, and it, it certainly is an exception, the exception proves the rule. Um, that is to say, the xenon-136 by a pure coincidence has an excited state which is long, lives long enough, I more than 10 to the minus 16 of a second, that seems like, like a very short time, but actually it's a very long time on the nuclear time scale, and it can decay by emitting a gamma, of course. But it is very, very enhanced. So we can uh, avoid getting the, the gamma radiation if we can conserve linear momentum. That is to say we have two products, not a capture reaction, therefore. We might need to conserve spin, because if you don't conserve spin, you will have to leave the, uh, the final product in an excited state, which will emit a gamma. And somehow, we have to arrange things such that the products are not beta radioactive. Now, we can't determine that, because <coughs> products are just products, aren't they? However, I would suggest to you that if we uh, start with the stable, product, the stable reactants, and the energy of our reaction is gentle, i.e. not um, 8 million electron volts per, uh, per nucleon, which is the typical binding energy. In other words, we're not uh, uh, capturing protons or neutrons, but we're doing something much less energetic. And it is probable that our products will also be non-radioactive, simply because they're in, in the value of stability of the nuclei, uh, they are already very close to something stable. Does that make sense to anybody? <laughs> well, it doesn't matter whether my, my reasoning is right. The proof of the pudding is the experiment. And I will come on to that in a minute. Okay, I've jumped, jumped ahead of myself. <laughs> How do we get heat? We don't want weak, weak interactions where the energy has, is going to be carried off by a neutrino. I've said this already. Instead, we need heavy particles which will dissipate that heat simply by uh, the breaking energy, which you've also heard about um, this morning. These heavy particles don't necessarily have to be charged, but if they are, that's OK. The uh, Jacques Rouet in uh, Toulouse last October um, analyzed the possibility that uh, hot spots could be caused by some kind of undefined, at that point, exotic neutral particle. I will go on to sit in a moment to explain what exotic neutral particle means, but I haven't quite finished um, the analysis of, of, uh, of theories. A, a 
typical objection at this point is that all this logic uh, does not take account of possible coherent solutions. A coherent solution is one in which all the, um, for example, deuterons in a lattice are oscillating in, in synchrony, and uh, you can amplify by a factor of pretty proportional to the number of such uh, oscillating particles. So in a typical um, granule of palladium, um, you might have a, a factor of, I don't know, 10 to the 16 or something like that. And that would, in, in, that would increase fusion rates by exactly the same factor, 10 to the 16. But that is not sufficient to uh, explain uh, the phenomena we observe. In particular, uh, Giuliano Preparato, who was a pioneer of this kind of theory, uh, had to invoke so-called potential wells in the palladium lattice in which two uh, deuterons could sink, if that's right word, and they could get rather close together, and they were also in synchrony, so there were all sorts of little miracles he was invoking to, to get this theory to work. Now, the trouble with that is, uh, Giuliano Preparato was not a, a chemist, but if he were a chemist, he would realize that if there was such a potential well, it would rip apart a helium, at helium atom. So helium would then bind to palladium in the same potential well, which is 80 electron volts, which is very high in chemistry. And we cannot observe this. Helium does not bind strongly to any metal at all. So I think this model is actually wrong. But it's, a, it's certainly worth considering. So my conclusion so far is that we have more than one reactant, so it's, otherwise it would be a decay. We have um, two reactants, actually, because otherwise it would be multi-body fusion. We have more than one product, so we can conserve linear momentum and thereby avoid prompt gammas. We need a neutral reactant, otherwise we have at least one neutral reactant, like a neutron, but it won't be a neutron, of course, uh, because otherwise we have a Coulomb barrier. And we need one neutral product, because we also have a Coulomb barrier for the separation of charged products. One of the reasons why um, actinides do not fission spontaneously very easily is that uh, the, the 200 million electron volts of energy produced by potential fission are only released when the daughter products are far apart. When they're close, <laughs> the, the, the potential energy is, is only a potential. There's a, a very high energy barrier which must be um, tunneled through. And um, you can, if, if, to, sh to show that this is correct, you can predict the asymmetric fission curves of, say, uh, uranium fission very accurately by applying standard gamma theory. <coughs> and of course, we need uh, an exothermic uh, reaction. Why have I put it? To avoid beta radioactivity. Don't understand that. <laughs> So what kind of models, real models, um, follow the, these, these guidelines? Um, am I in your way? <laughs> uh, uh, Yuri Barshutov came up with the so-called Erzion model in the early 90s, I think, probably 91, something like that. Uh, independently, uh, John Fisher came up with polyneutrons also about the same time, and maybe a year later, uh, there was an uncatalyzed um, uh, uh, version, um, which Peter Hagenstein, the author, called Neutron Hopping. I think he's abandoned that now. Now, wh whatever uh, solution we have to the, uh, the cold fusion conundrum, we have to explain certain observations. And the most fundamental ones are probably helium-4, heat, la the lack of radiation, which I keep mentioning, and the failure to detect any of these exotic neutral particles, which I would like to invoke. So I presume that there are very few exotic neutral particles, so few that they're, they are going to be difficult to detect. And they're neutral, so they're going through a gag counter, for example, they're not going to register anything. Going for, uh, they may not interact with a sodium iodide crystal directly, so who knows? But if there are very few of them, we need, they need to be very, very efficacious. And I've gone through some of the, uh, the reasonings which suggest they will have a very high cross-section for a nuclear interaction. 
So basically, the, the minimal model which I would like to uh, outline to you assumes there are just two species of neutron transfer carriers. They react exothermically and catalytically with a limited number of natural isotopes. Uh, I've written <coughs> some horrible formulae here uh, where R and Q are, uh, are specific isotopes, and I've used um, Bajutov's Etzion notation. Um, it's called E0 and EN. E0 is simply uh, uh, the empty um, carrier, and EN is carrying one neutron. So one neutron can be transferred at a time by these reactions. Uh, in John Fisher's polyneutron theory, in contrast, more than one neutron can be transferred, and we can imagine that the, uh, the, trans the, the exotic nuclear particle, neutral particle, the polyneutron, um, either grows or shrinks. Uh, I'll, I, will go in, I don't know if I've got time to go into the details as to why I don't like the polyneutron uh, model quite so much. Or maybe someone will ask a question I will answer. Well, why do I call my model a minimal model? Well, Bashutov also had a negatively charged um, etzium. And if this existed, in my opinion, it would catalyze muonic-like fusion, which we don't observe. Uh, an etzion, according to Bashutov, is even heavier than a muon, so it would catalyze um, uh, plot fusion, effectively, at a very, very high rate. Um, I calculated for a muon, the rate should be 10 to the 11 a second, um, but actually, it's, the chemistry is the rate limiting factor, and it goes down to about 10 to the 8 reactions a second. So, uh, <coughs> these are extremely fast rates, and they are, in fact, rates which, are, which if they existed, would be much faster than the, the, limit, the very high limit of 50,000 reactions a second. So, I'm suggesting that uh, if Jacques Roy's calculations are correct, and I'm sure they are, that maybe these exotic neutral particles, one particle is causing a hot spot which we observe. I do not know of any other theory which explains hot, hot spots. But if we have an exotic particle which is extremely efficient catalyst, then we can do so. So I would suggest to you that, you know, we have a, there's a kind of crystallization of ideas in and which is to explain some of the observations. Um, and as, also, as you can see on the screen, the reason why I, I discount uh, Fisher's um, theory of polyneutrons is that a polyneutron would pick up a neutron from deuterium in heavy water and grow and grow and grow indefinitely. We, <coughs> no one has noticed heavy water getting very hot. <laughs> so I suspect by itself. So I suspect this is also as well. Or rather, it's incomplete. I prefer to take the um, take the view that we can we can limit the, uh, the, the characteristics of the exotic neutral particle so it becomes a mineral one. It takes one neutron, and that's the limit. So yes, so when an, an, uh, the S, whatever you call it, arrives in heavy water, picks up a neutron, and then stops. Doesn't do anything useful. So again, so how did I go about analysing this? Um, uh, I wrote some software 20 odd years ago called NSAM, which allows me to uh, analyse exhaustively all the possible interactions with all known isotopes. Though of course I'm limiting myself to naturally occurring isotopes. And I assume, uh, because it's convenient, that the spin is conserved. But if spin is not conserved, we will be in and we expect to emit gammas in our reactions. And I asked myself, what kind of naturally occurring isotopes could support a self-sustaining nuclear reaction? By self-sustaining, I mean something like a, a uranium reaction in which uh, a neutron is, is captured by uh, an actinide. It then fissions, produces more neutrons, and the neutrons recirculate. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say in this particular case the neutrons are catalysts, but they are obviously an essential part of the chain reaction. So uh, the lightest uh, chain reaction possible is with lithium, and um, you can see from the, uh, the screen 
that the energies are very, very modest. We're talking about less than one mev in, in the first two cases. <coughs> um, so lithium-6 can uh, donate a, new, a neutron and become a lithium-5, which then spontaneously emits a proton and helium-4, so we have heat and helium. Alternatively, it can uh, <coughs> accept a neutron and become lithium-7. And we don't expect any radiation from any of these three reactions. I think, um, Jean-Paul, you'll be happy to know that carbon is another possible <laughs> element, but this time uh, we need to use the uh, rather rare carbon-30 isotope. But again, a chain reaction is possible. We can produce energy, no radiation, but no helium. And the next one, and I'm, I'm going through these in, in, in weight order, is tungsten. Tungsten uh, um, has been used by uh, my Italian colleagues, uh, Iorio and um, company, but not only, I don't think. <coughs> yep, maybe, yeah, sure, sure. So, and again, we get some heat <coughs> and no uh, chain reaction, but no helium. Do you have a question? understand how do you compute the, the value of the energy because you just get one reaction and the other one and uh, what are the, the experimental uh, uh, proofs that... Uh, Can I answer that question in just a few minutes because another slide is coming, okay? That's a very good question, okay? I have to say though that uh, the energy of the, the masses of these hypothetical particles, ENPs, and generally speaking, not very critical. However, for, for, the, for the purposes of this analysis, I have assumed certain values, which I will justify very shortly. Okay. And the last one, almost, is platinum. Platinum's use, of course, is anode in almost all the electrolytic cells. So I'm suggesting the heat is not formed in the palladium, <coughs> but in the anode. And here we have um, our first problem, actually. <laughs> Um, platinum 192, which is a minor isotope in, in natural platinum, uh, can um, be transmuted into platinum 193. And when I saw this, I was really disappointed, I have to say. Because I thought, uh oh, we now have a beta radioactive product, no one has ever detected this, and therefore this theory must be wrong. Well, there are two things I could say. The first one is that uh, the energy of the reaction is at 6 kilo electron volts. That is a tiny energy. So by moving the masses just a little bit, we could probably eliminate that inconvenient fact. But actually, it's not necessary. Platinum 193 decays by electron capture, and it emits a 9 keV um, gamma ray. 9 keV is about, it's half of what uh, the old-fashioned televisions used to produce. It's a completely innocuous, you never detected, it would not pass through glass glassware, might pass through a piece of paper, but that's about it, that's about it. So unless you're going out of your way to look for it, you're not going to notice any radioactivity. Now, I'll just go back a moment to carbon. Uh, the carbon also produced um, carbon-14. Carbon-14, when it decays after 5,700 years, if I'm not mistaken, does not produce any gammas. So unless you're looking for radioactivity, you're not going to find it. <coughs> well, I haven't mentioned deuterium very much. <coughs> deuterium is probably the second best donor of neutrons because it binds its, its neutron rather weakly with about 2.2 million electron volts. So um, it's proposed to... Uh, interact with ions, um, producing fast protons. Fast protons have been measured in the laboratory by Ken Telly, if I'm not mistaken. That's fine. It has also been suggested that uh, uh, deuterium could pick up a neutron and become tritium. <coughs> That's a big problem here, because tritium in the uh, deuterated um, system is a fast, tri a fast triton, uh, it's, it's, it's going to interact with deuterium and there's an enhanced arrestment uh, reaction to 
produce fast neutrons. We don't see these fast neutrons. And therefore, <coughs> Bashutov and others have fiddled the, the, the masses of the, uh, the Erzions in such a way that <coughs> tritium is produced at low energy. And as you can see here, I filled it to two kilo electron volts, which is probably below any threshold, but it causing danger. But it might even be an endothermic reaction. And uh, what tritium we do measure could, could simply be due to the kinetic energy of the, uh, the incoming Erzion, the, or the uh, exotic neutral particle. So I don't see this as a, a grave um, uh, objection either. This answers your question now, because I've just confessed that I've, I've followed um, uh, others in specifying the, the, the delta mass of the Earth's That's all we need to know. We don't need to know the actual absolute masses. All we need to know is how much energy is released were we to set up a neutron or add a neutron. So, what are the fuels? By fuel, I mean a neutron donor. And they are tritium, lithium, carbon-13, tungsten, platinum, and uranium-238. There are some other ones as well, but they don't conserve spin. But spin may not be important. We don't know. I'm, I'm assuming spin is important, because I might want to be conservative and make, as initial suggestions, what particular fuels we might want to have in our, in our cells. We also need neutron acceptors. And we can imagine that in a heterogeneous system, one isotope could be a donor, and another one could be an acceptor. However, there are too many um, acceptors to this. If somebody wants to communicate privately with me, I'll, I'll give them a complete list. OK, this is my final slide. Uh, this kind of system uh, predicts chain reactions producing heat, helium, without penetrating radiations. This is absolutely fundamental of any theory. And yet so many theories fail at this first hurdle. All the elements which are predicted as being uh, interesting have already been verified in the laboratory as uh, producing anomalies. Very specific isotopic anomalies are predicted by this theory, and therefore it is highly testable scientific theory. Any questions?